Sakri, can you hear us? Uh, yes, very clearly. Okay, thank you. So, good afternoon all. Welcome to our fifth session. Today we have Dr. Gayatri taking a session on medical ethics for us. So, we can start with ma'am's presentation. We can have it for 40 to 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. We can have our case presentation by 4 o'clock, followed by its discussion. We can wind up our session by 4.30. So thank you all for joining in. Over to Dr. Sri Devi. Uh, ma'am, we can't hear you, ma'am. Okay, yeah. Uh, hi, all. Uh, welcome to next session of ECHO. Um, today we have Dr. Gayatri uh, Palat for taking medical ethics. Uh, she's uh, the head. The, she's heading the Department of Palliative Medicine in MNJ Cancer Hospital, Hyderabad. And uh, I, I don't have enough words to explain the work. It will take a long day to explain, but still, she's the one person who is working with the stakeholders to make pal uh, palliative care integrated very well into the health system. And I remember someone uh, from uh, someone from last few sessions asked about some insurance, uh, financial issues, dealing with the government. I, then I told we have people working for that and then she is the person. So those who have asked me those questions, uh, uh, Dr. Gayatri is the person working with the government. Uh, welcome, ma'am. It's very, uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to see you for us uh, and giving time for us in between your busy schedule. Uh, my pleasure, Dr. Sri Devi. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to participate in this discussion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Sri Devi, if I know, like, who all are there in the group, like, just I don't need the introduction, but just generally to get. Yeah. Them. Yeah. So they are all like, uh, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, we did last year uh, like that. Um, uh, church, they are all uh, sister doctors uh, under Chai. I hope uh, last year they came there for hands-on training in your institute. Yes, uh, the yes, same yes. group, uh, same kind of uh, group, like sister doctors. Uh, plus, there is one doctor uh, apart from Chai, Dr. Jagriti. Uh, others are all related to Chai from different parts of uh, uh, India. And so many are from your state. So they were asking a lot of questions regarding uh, the I mean, health system related issues. Then I told there will be some person who will be able to answer those questions later. Absolutely, yeah, it's a pleasure in fact. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, I hope with us, uh, the slide sharing will be done by uh, yes, yes, by, yes, yeah. Okay, so good evening to all of you. Um, today, um, I'm going to speak a little bit, I'm going to give an overview about ethics in palliative care and. I saw a case um, case presentation which was shared to me, which you're going to take up after my presentation. And um, so a lot of this will be repeated as we uh, discuss the case, which is going to be presented by one of the uh, doctors. And uh, But uh, for my um, presentation, uh, I will also take you through one case, one case, patient, and then uh, understand the ethical part why are we discussing ethics so much in palliative care and uh, let's see like where we stand today with our concerns and our issues yeah so um, first slide yeah so when we talk about ethics we heard i'm sure all of us we read about ethics in during our, our medicine days when we studied medicine during um, or I think forensic, uh, that's the time I remember I studied a little bit about uh, medical ethics and, um, and I learned some basic principles which uh, defines uh, medical ethics. But what makes us define, okay, how do you, what, what, what is medical ethics and on what basis we decide, okay, this is ethical and this is not ethical. What do you mean by ethics? That's a basic question. Anyone wishes to answer, just raise your hands. What constitutes, like, what, how do you, when do you say, yeah, this is ethical and this is not ethical? What makes you decide? Is it guided by something, some principle? Is it guided by some, your own personal belief system? How is it, like, how, on what basis? 
because we discuss quite a lot in our medicine this is not ethical this is yeah this is the right way of ethical way to practice it so dr lelis you wish to answer ethic is based on the moral rules of the state or moral rules of the of the religion which is followed which are followed in the state thank you very much so i see two response here one is you're talking about your own own moral values which is prevalent in a particular society which decides so this is ethical and other part is you are saying something to do with religion your faith which decides i cannot do certain things based on my faith this is what i will do or i cannot do so that's another part which decides what is ethically right or what is wrong any other angle to it which makes us say this is right or this is not right yeah next slide so generally when you talk about ethics it's guided by certain things and it's it's not legal it's nothing to do with legality the legal part of concept yes it do um, it does constitute some part of it some element of ethics is defined by legal issues but it's not legal is something different from ethics what is legal is it is framed by that particular state by the government but the ethics is very much governed by the culture prevailing culture the custom the religion morality and uh, etiquette these are few things which constitutes what what concerns what is ethical which we decide a body of people decide this is ethical and this is not ethical so uh, uh next slide in our medicine we the scope of medical ethics is when you talk about promotion of ethical practice we must practice ethical medicine that's what we always we are taught so it comes when you talk about promotion of ethical practice it also comes into picture when you talk about prevention of ethical breaches we should not do anything which breaches the ethical practice often we it also comes into play when you talk about ethical dilemma what is right or what is wrong we don't know what is right for a particular patient and often we face with dilemma that's the time we think about ethics and many times we talk about resolution of ethical conflicts when there's a con uh, any situ uh, conflict situation um um so that's the time we um, we talk about ethical uh, we bring ethical um, discussion and there's a conflict about whether in a hospital suppose you have somebody on ventilator and you want to take patient out of ventilator there's a con conflict and that's the time we discuss what is it, whether it's ethical or not next slide so like i said even though we have a case presentation but still i thought i'll present a case to take you along this case to make a kind of um, sense of what is that why ethics is being discussed so much in palliative care practice so here we have a gentleman with 21 year old gentleman with relapsed acute myeloid leukemia so leukemia he took treatment but it got relapsed now he's a young man now he complains of bleeding from the nose gums and petechi petechi has all his uh, petechial patches all over the body only a week back he received platelet and paxil transfusion now just only a week and now again he developed bleeding and the relatives demand blood transfusion will you give him blood now do you think it's good for him to take blood transfusion if yes why if no no i don't want to give blood transfusion why what makes you think that he should not be the, it doesn't make sense to give blood transfusion so here we have a young gentleman with relapsed aml which means the progressive disease and is bleeding and only a week back he received blood transfusion just to, some thoughts around that whether you'll go for it or not to go for it either way it's like it's a very thin line between right or wrong when you talk about this is not right or this is right it's a thin line so but there must be some reason like people may decide this side or that side anyone having a thought on it i know people are thinking uh, uh, about it dr nimi yeah it's right to from my part it's right to give the blood transfusion and paxil because the patient is a case of aml and is also his bleeding 
so there will be uh, chances of uh, left platelet or all the uh, back means like uh, hb also will be low so it's like needed to give blood transfusion and also platelet back so platelet yeah. medically if you look at it he has low platelet that's the reason he's bleeding and uh, and so obviously at the medical medical point of view that's a treatment when a platelet count drops you give transfusion you give platelet and when patient is bleeding or the hemoglobin may fall and you need transfusion that's a very medical point of view to this um, uh, this diagram okay that's a very good point you said but he received pla uh, platelet and uh, back cell only a week ago so i wonder how much it's helping him actually it's again coming back so okay now this time you give within two days again he comes back with bleeding when will you say do you ever say it's enough or you keep on giving even if it is matter of few hours what will be your stand on that because we know that when there's advanced leukemia this completely bone marrow fails you give transfusion just the body receives it and other side it's bleeding it just body loses the whole blood products whatever you given so after some time it doesn't work actually so will you give blood transfusion suppose now this time you will decide to say okay i'm going to give blood now next time within two days he comes back again with the bleeding will you give blood is there any point where you say in uh, the i wish like no there won't be any point of give but like uh, since he is alive i wish to give like okay since he is alive you wish to give till the last day suppose he is almost um, you know that is end of uh, nearing end of life care but still because he is alive you want to give okay that's a very firm medical uh, view point which you have taken uh, to talk about uh, transfusion in the 29 is there any problem with by giving blood transfusion why are we even discussing about it we know that if you don't give blood he'll bleed he may bleed into brain and he may develop complications um, and there are other issues otherwise uh, he may bleed even if it for few hours you want to give blood but is there any problem in giving blood transfusion there will be like chances of reaction and chance of like to show all like uh, there will be iron overload if you give repeated blood transfusion iron overload transfusion reaction yeah any other problem which you can for we can anticipate you know that there are acute complications and there's a long term complication of any when you give repeated blood transfusion people who receive repeated blood transfusion they are always at risk of there like a lot of complications yeah there's somebody saying they are more prone for transfusion reaction um and uh, um, as like um, we know that infection they highly prone for acquiring infection without uh, realizing um and delayed complications like somebody mentioned uh, 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 developing dep uh, iron deposit we, we see that typically in thalassemia repeated blood transfusion yeah how about the cost part of it is it easy cheap giving blood transfusion and somebody mentions anaphylactic reaction yes absolutely that's a very life threatening and one more thing i would definitely add here is that a frail patient advanced cancer you know that how advanced cancer patients or any advanced disease not just cancer they are very frail and they lose body mass and they are just barely managed so when you there is a fluid overload a transfusion overload you tend to produce more damage to pulmonary edema and they develop more dyspnea and that can affect the quality of life so that's a big big concern which we see in all our terminally ill patients for giving blood transfusion how about the cost part of it how much typically a transfusion cost suppose i decide for a transfusion i say okay bring this gentleman to my hospital i want to give blood what does it mean uh, giving a, so the whole process how much it may cost average blood transfusion in a hospital okay, 1200 for each uh, bottle yeah so somebody is mentioning here again looking at the problems of blood transfusion aggravate congestive cardiac failure absolutely and you could produce more harm than doing good and somebody as some um, uh, one of you mentioned it costs around 1000 1500 rupees that's just the cost of getting the blood we don't see a lot of hidden cost involved when you talk about blood transfusion 
shifting the patient from the house to the hospital. He cannot walk, he cannot come by bus. Naturally, with advanced disease, they have to be moved in an ambulance or in a, some way kind of vehicle. The cost of that, when the patient is being transferred, the household people, they, the caregivers, they take leave. So they lose their wages and this patient is brought to the hospital. The hospital room charges, the nursing charges, and equipment, when you buy a cannula and a blood transfusion set, all these are hidden costs which we don't realize. And we are just, what we see is just the cost of getting the blood and the, uh, the screening which is performed before giving blood transfusion. These are all very hidden costs. So average, easily it may cost a family five to 6,000 each transfusion, if not more. And the hardship, do you see any problem with the patient? When you talk about problems of blood transfusion, one thing which we often don't realize is that these patients, when they undergo repeated chemotherapy, is it easy to find veins in these patients? It's very difficult to find veins. The most veins have gone, collapsed, thrombosed. And when you talk about red blood transfusion, you need a good vein. And it's so painful when you look for trying to get a vein for this kind of patient. And the, and the ex, ex, effort the hospital team takes to get a proper vein and then give the blood transfusion. And when the, you do it repeatedly, it produces more such a traumatic experience for the patient. And the, very often when the patient says, just leave me alone, I don't want it anymore. That's the kind of stand most patients they take because of the pain involved in taking the transfusion each time. And each time they're moving, they would have completely exhausted their resources. This patient and the family for the treatment of leukemia, they would have already exhausted the resources. And when you say, okay, one more transfusion, what would happen? They may have the one last piece of land which must be remaining with them. They'll decide to sell that piece of land because you have asked for a transfusion. And after selling that piece of land, they'll come to the hospital. And for what? Again, two days, the uh, is going to bleed again. And by, by that time, what will happen? The children in the house, household, they are on the street because they're left with nothing and they drop out from the school they're left with you no know, shelter and the huge whole of future generation sometimes they lose their life just because of this simple uh, procedures which we think is simple but it has such a long-term implication so i'm just saying i'm giving you a perspective about when you talk about blood transfusion yes from a medical point of view it's very straightforward bleeding trans transfusion but it may carry a lot of dimensions which we normally you don't think about. Next slide. So it's a big dilemma when you talk about these kind of issues and we don't know then when to stop, when to say enough is enough. Should we stop or not? Is it ethically all right to stop? So when we are not very sure, there are certain principles which we try to follow to take a kind of stand on this issue. The first principle is, next slide change. What we call it as patient's autonomy. Most very important, any treatment when we plan is does the patient want it or not? My body, I want what treatment to be taken on my body. It's my decision. So patient's autonomy, patient involved in decision making. Next slide. But when you talk about autonomy, my right, it comes from the Greek word self-rule. What does the patient want? Yeah, next slide. But when you talk about uh, autonomy, let me take my own decision. Next slide. The practice of, of autonomy happens only when a, you give a full information in the language and wording that promote patient understanding. A patient cannot take a decision if the patient does not understand the implication of it. If you say blood transfusion, you take blood transfusion, and your bleeding will come down. Patient will go for it. But you go a little further, deeper into information that you take blood transfusion, you, the bleeding may stop. But if you notice, last one week, you took one blood, and within a week time, the blood, uh, again, it has come back. So if you take now, there's a chance that within a few days, again, you may require more blood. So doctor, do I need to take again and again? Yes. And slowly, more and more, the duration between each transfusion may come down. It may not, not, may not last even for a day or two. Then, doctor, what is the point of taking blood transfusion? Yes, you're right. Over a period of time, there may be no value of taking this transfusion because you're... Why? And then, of course, then you come back to this whole thing about how much the patient understands the diagnosis, 
the prognosis, the implication of when you say relapse. So all this discussion will come there. The communication, I'm sure you would have had a session on communication by now. So we talk to that patient about breaking bad news, prognostication. So all this discussion comes here. And when the patient fully understands the implication of it, and then the patient takes a decision, that is, the, that is full autonomy. And a patient can take decision only when he has the required information and, and he has a capacity to make decision. So the patient is confused, delirious, or mentally challenged. He cannot take that decision. That's the time you may have to take help of others. But generally, a patient must have the information and the capacity to make decision. That is the first principle which we follow. So when you're not very really sure what is right or what is wrong, the one thing which may help you make a decision is what, is, what does the patient want, patient's autonomy. Next slide. The second principle is doing good to the patient. Is my treatment giving any benefit to the patient? Next slide. Now the benefit, what do you mean by futile care? This is the term we use called futile care. Don't, we think about treatment like giving blood transfusion in advanced disease, oxygen in a dying patient, antibiotics in advanced AIDS, in dying AIDS, HIV AIDS patient, and giving chemotherapy in a very advanced relapsed diseases. Sometimes those treatment are no more a treatment. This is what we call it as futile treatment, which means that See, when we give any treatment, the goal of medical care is to achieve a certain benefit. Some minimum benefit we must achieve above a certain minimal threshold. If you don't achieve even that benefit, that treatment ceases to be a treatment. Then it becomes futile. For example, ventilation, mechanical giving of artificial ventilation in a very advanced disease, advanced cancer. It doesn't give any, even a minimal benefit above that minimal threshold. That is a futile care, a futile treatment. So when you talk about doing good to the patient, is my treatment is a tr good treatment or is it giving any benefit or is it a futile care? That's something you have to define. Next slide. So the, like I said, it is a care that fails to achieve that benefit. Even that benefit, if it is not achieved, then it is a futile care. Next slide. The benefit is very subjective. What you may think is beneficial. Now, when I started this question, uh, I asked blood transfusion. One of you felt very strongly that blood, as long as he is alive, I want to give blood transfusion. You think the benefit is that patient may benefit till the end of life. But physician's benefit may be different from patient's point benefit. Next slide. When you're not very sure, go by patient's perception of benefit. Is the blood transfusion giving, any, am I feeling any better by taking blood transfusion? He may say, last time when I took blood, I felt I didn't feel any benefit. I took blood, went home. Within a week, week I started feeling tired. I started bleeding. So I don't think that blood transfusion last time gave me any benefit. Similarly, when you talk about oxygen, when you're giving oxygen to end of life care patients, you may think, oh, oxygen. When we, any dyspnea, we think oxygen. But often we are seeing that in advanced disease, oxygen does not have any benefit. But we are not very sure. So what we do, what we call it as a trial therapeutic, um, therapeutic trial. We give oxygen to the patient and, and we'll tell them, I'm going to put you on oxygen for some time, say half an hour. And I'm, after half an hour, you tell me whether it's going to, you, do you feel better with oxygen or not? If the patient feels better, I'll continue. The patient does not feel better. The patient himself will pull away the mask or from whatever you have given. So that's what we call, that's something what we call benefit and from patient's perspective benefit. Next slide. So first was patient's autonomy. Second, doing good to the patient. That means my treatment should give some benefit to the patient about the minimum threshold. The third principle is in, in this attempt to give treatment, I should not cause more harm. If I'm causing more harm than doing good, that is also not ethically permissible. Again, when I'm give, giving blood transfusion, the repeated transfer to the hospital, painful procedures, you make the patient suffer because you can't find the line and then shifting to theater, calling the anesthetist, and then they're struggling to find veins. 
and then giving just transfusion, getting thrombos, developing reactions. And after all this, within two days, patient comes back. So am I really giving benefit to him or am I causing more harm in this whole effort, this whole thing about giving that transfusion? So sometimes this also is a very governing principle as I should not be causing more harm by my treatment. Chemotherapy. If the patient has got only three months to live, for example, because of his cancer, do I want that patient to spend his last few days in his home, surrounded by his loved ones, comfortably, or I want him to spend that last three months in the hospital taking some more chemotherapy, which may, I'm not very really sure, may give benefit him by extra few days more. So sometimes that's the decision we have to take and sometimes this is something helps us to make a decision. We should not cause more harm than doing good. Next slide. Now harm, harm can be, the uh, next slide. The harm can be treatment side effect. Next slide. Or it can be physical, emotional, social and financial harm. It's not just the physical harm. It's the treatment side effect. When you talk about is my treatment producing more harm to the patient? Harm can be any of these dimensions. So that's something we have to think about when you talk about causing harm. The fourth principle is justice. Balancing the needs of the individual with that of the society. If the patient, as I said the story, this patient, you decided to go for blood transfusion, and they have already exhausted all the resources. And now one more blood transfusion, the family decides to sell the house because they don't have any money left with them. Or they mortgage the house and get the money and they come for blood transfusion. Is it justified to do something for this patient who is not expected to leave for another few more weeks, compromising the, well, the future of the children who are at home, who may need a shelter, who's schools who may drop out from the school whose future may get affected. So that's why we call it as justice. Next slide. The justice can be distribution of resources. When you talk about resources, it's not just resources of the family. Resources of the hospital. We say um, India is a poor country. We always keep full. And our hospital resources we use without thinking whether it's, uh, am I wasting the resources? Giving oxygen in advanced disease, it's a waste of a resource. Giving blood transfusion, I may have this rare blood group, B positive, B negative. I may use it for the patient who requires surgery, then use it for this patient. It's an ethical dilemma, but that's a fair distribution of resources. Yeah, and uh, oxygen, antibiotics, blood transfusion, all these are, sometimes we don't think about the resources which we are using of the hospital. Resources of the nation. You may think, oh, my hospital is a free hospital. Okay, the government hospital gives free treatment. But they're using taxpayers' resources. Are we justified in using the resources and wasting just because we're getting it free? So distribution of resources is also something that we're mindful of. Competing needs. You have one ventilator in the hospital. Will you put that ventilator for a elderly patient, advanced cancer, who is dysnic, or a young boy? who needs really a ventilator support because he's developed some complication to chemotherapy. The competing needs, rights and obligations, patients' rights and obligations, and conflict with established legislation. Uh, what is the law says, and for that purpose of law, sometimes we continue treatment. So that's a part of justice. So justice is a big thing. But for me, the basic part of justice is resources, how well we use the resources. Next slide. So, coming back to this patient, 21-year-old patient with relapsed AML, who's bleeding. Just one week back, he received blood transfusion. Now he's bleeding again. So, well, we shall give blood transfusion or not. If you give this time, when do we stop? Or do we stop at all or not? So, when you're not very sure, these all four principles we take into account and we try to balance all four dimensions of medical ethics. Patient's autonomy. What does the patient want? Beneficence. Is it really beneficial? Is, it, uh, is the benefit pursuable to the patient? Non-maleficence. Is it causing more harm to the patient than doing good? 
and justice. Am I using uh, uh, resources carefully? Fair, is it a fair utilization of resources? So this is how we try to balance all the four principles and take a decision. Often it's very difficult, right or wrong, this side or that side, it can go the either way. But this sometimes when you're not very really sure, please think about these four principles and you may make a, a fairly reasonable decision about what to do, what is right for this question. Any thoughts? Any Thanks. thoughts? Just raise your hands if you have any. I don't know most of the participants. <laughs> so, uh, but it will be helpful. If, uh, I know that most of you are working in hospitals where you do multitasking, you're seeing many, many patients, and I'm sure you relate with many of these issues. So your experience will be more um, um, helpful for us to understand uh, the ethical part of it. Uh, Dr. Vinay, you wish to speak, Doctor? Yeah. Yes. Very many times the patient is not able to make a decision for himself or herself when they are in such a condition. A very good question. Uh, what to do when the patient can't decide for themselves? Yeah. This is a situation we often face is when you have a child coming for treatment because the child is not competent um, to take a decision for himself to up a certain age. They say that the child as old as age of eight years or more, they can take for the decide for themselves, but still they're minor. Sometimes that's a situation where they have to take decision. A unconscious patient, confused patient, patient with intellectual disability. Then dementia patients. So this is a situation where we often face this ethical dilemma. First of all, they say that when you uh, uh, very often these patients are well in the early stages, that's the time you may have to start this discussion, which we call it as advanced directive. We take the uh, but or also it is known as living will. When the patients are well, we talk of start discussing this discussion that suppose your condition becomes persons and there may arise a situation where you may have to go for very advanced kind of treatment which may or may not give benefit to you in terms of your disease condition or your feeling of um, quality of life. Would you like to go for such treatment if that situation arises? That kind of discussion, we, if we start early on, we have and we document it, that is fairly, that is what it should be and it is legally also you are protected in doing that. So that is one way of looking at it, advanced directive. But very often, we don't, more often, we don't get that situation. We get situation where they just walk into the casualty and we see patients in this condition or a child. In that situation, what we look at is I, what we call it a surrogate. The surrogate is a, someone who makes the decision on patient's behalf. And surrogate may be the clo first surrogate who's most uh, clo uh, legally closest to the patient is a spouse and then children and then siblings. And uh, if there's no one around like that, maybe friends, they're really known to be good friends. If not, it's still destitute, the state decides. The state takes up the decision and the state decides on behalf of the patient. This is how they decide the surrogacy. So it's another area altogether to discuss in a big way. But this is how we take a decision. So we look at the surrogate and ask their, uh, uh, ask their opinion. And also we ask, suppose when the patient was well, has the patient ever expressed this kind of uh, a wish as to what to do in the event in, in such event what to do so we look at their previous such kind of discussions so this is how we deal with this kind of situation i hope i made any sense uh, doctor yeah in our, uh, in our indian scenario most of the times the relatives or their close uh, persons of the patient does not want to us to, uh, us to relate to the patient regarding their disease or how low, what the prognosis and what actually they are suffering from. Many times it happens that 
so we are not able to tell them or discuss in an early stage because always the relatives or their close uh, uh, father or mother or whoever they want their children or their spouse or their loved ones to live much more without knowing actually what they are having they are suffering from so in Absolutely. that case yeah and I, I think the patient's autonomy is not really exercised in our Indian context. We hardly actually discuss with the patient. Many a times we are blocked by this um, person of the relative. And I think you, have, you must have had some discussions around that when you, when you discussed collusion in the communication class. Um, is it covered, Dr. Sri Devi, uh, uh, already? Or is it going to be no, no, no. It's yet to come communication yes, sessions. Uh, okay. So this is yeah. a situation what we call this collusion. The relatives collude with the, uh, um, the caregiver, the, pay, uh, the doctor, and say, don't tell the patient the diagnosis. And that really interferes with uh, having a good, um, developing good relationship with the patient. The situation what we call the collusion. And we face this again and again, again every day in our practice. And in the case discussion which is going to follow now, I think we are going to bring this up again. The doctor will bring this up, this, this part of patient's autonomy again in the case discussion. Yes, but a very valid point. Yeah. So, I can think more about it, but meanwhile, let me go to the next part of it. Next slide. The same patient, patient with advanced leukemia, probably he was bleeding into his lungs and also developed a lot of infection. He was bleeding into the lungs. He started developing shortness of breath he's extremely breathless and he's bleeding so he's, i think he also got a lot of pain and he was suggested morphine and midazolam for breathlessness this is the standard treatment protocol uh, when you talk about um, pain and breathlessness simple breathlessness in advanced disease we use uh, opioids opioids like morphine and benzodiazepines the benzodiazepines for various reasons, it's found to be very useful for people with shortness of breath. So this is a combination we often use in advanced disease, intractable dyspnea. Next slide. But then when you're using these uh, medications, often this question is, are we hastening the death? Because we think that this kind of sedation may blunt his respiratory drive and he may not breathe properly and that may hasten his death. So are we hastening his death by doing that? First of all, let me look at the um, evidence part of it. Let's talk about the evidence part of it. Now, I'm sure you had, did you have a discussion on dyspnea and advanced disease? Class on dyspnea and advanced disease? Sri Devi? No, no, not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. We have just uh, had uh, pain. As, uh, so you would have discussed at length about opioid usage in pain. Yes, yes. The area yes. where we discuss opioids is when you talk about advanced disease and intractable dyspnea. And from a medical point of view, there's enough evidence to say that by using opioids, we are not facing the death in significantly in any way. It may be few few minutes or few hours, but otherwise no major significant difference between patients who does not receive uh, opioids and patients who receive opioid in dyspnea. Whereas when you use opioids in dyspnea, it gives a significant benefit experience. There are enough studies and we are, I'm not discussing this opioid in dyspnea here, but the point I want to make here is that medically it is indicated and it has not shown to hasten death as the way we think. Because that's our traditional teaching, morphine depresses uh, uh, dyspnea, uh, breathing and you may hasten death. That happens when you give a bolus dose of opioids uh, morphine injection in the ICUs and they stop suddenly breathing. Whereas in this situation, we talk about titrating dose of opioids and does not hasten death. But still, there is an ethical dilemma somewhere because somewhere we are still doubtful because when the patient has advanced disease, he is very weak and very frail. And when you give these kind of medications, there's a chance that patient is more... Um, th th there may be a dilemma around that. Next slide. That is where we talk about the risk versus benefit associated with any intervention. Now, when you, for example, the 
this is not just an end of life care situation any intervention when you do any medical intervention there is always a risk and there's a benefit but often the benefit is so much that we we think that risk is not significant enough for us not to give treatment it extends even our regular practice for example when i give chemotherapy when you give chemotherapy there is you give chemotherapy because you expect that the patient to cure cancer by chemotherapy we are going to cure cancer but we also know that chemotherapy can suppress uh, bone marrow and there's a chance that patient may develop neutropenia and this uh, thrombocytopenia and we have seen some patients they develop extreme reaction to chemotherapy and they may die because of extreme neutropenia or thrombocytopenia but that doesn't prevent us from not giving chemotherapy because we still we are hoping that we are, we are expecting his cancer cure and the risk we we possibly weigh risk versus benefit next slide and this is known as principle of double effect the double effect means when one in, 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 one treatment one intention is to affect for one therapeutic effect when you also get some burden that is known as principle of double effect next slide it can be def uh, defined as an act having two possible foreseen effect we know that this may happen one good and one harmful it's not always morally morally prohibited if the harmful effect is not intended what they look at is what is your intention when i'm giving morphine to a patient advanced disease and dyspnea what is my intention is my intention to cure the disease no my intention at that point of time is to to provide comfort he should not suffer even though he is a advanced disease he is almost dying but he is suffering so my intention is to reduce his suffering my intention is to give comfort so my intention of giving morphine is to produce that comfort but in the process there's a chance that his death may be hastened which is legally and ethically also acceptable that is what we known as principle of double effect have i confused you do you want to challenge is total silence dr shri devi hello uh, dr shri i i i yeah i missed the, i couldn't hear the last part it was completely gone i was searching where did i go was it clear for everyone i didn't uh, it was clear for everyone uh, oh, i i couldn't hear it was it was audible to everyone as no, ma'am no, was asking yeah. was there any confusion between what she said hello hello yes doctor we can hear you raju i think i i have some uh, network problem i can't hear you sorry uh, okay ma'am you I'll can just check yeah yeah i'll just check i'll just check okay sure hello uh, dr gayatri i think you can continue yeah okay next slide next slide um it's not uh, yeah so then many people they may ask so is it euthanasia because you're talking about suffering and you're giving morphine so is it euthanasia now let's understand very clearly the definition of euthanasia have you heard about this ter terminology called euthanasia just Are raise your just raise your hands if you have heard it raise your hands ah uh, yes we can, we can see so yeah. many hands coming up yes. okay great i know that is a very so much debated these days and we keep hearing news about a newspaper article about euthanasia and the legal implication so let's be very clear with the definition of euthanasia euthanasia are often known as mercy killing it is deliberate intervention undertaken by a doctor with the express intention of ending life to relieve relieve intractable suffering so here the two things we have to understand is intractable suffering okay 
and intention is deliberate intention to end the life we are intent we are giving medicine to end the life when the patient asks for it the patient has to ask for it and if i give medicine to end some a person's life because the suffering is intractable that is known as euthanasia if the patient is not asking for it or oh, i feel he is suffering so much let me end his life that is murder if the patient does not have suffering and still i i give it, i give any intervention to end his life that is also murder so there is a clear definition when you say euthanasia the patient has to ask for it there has to be intractable suffering and my intention is to end the life and this is totally different from giving morphine in advanced dyspnea because there my intention is not to end the life my intention is give titrating dose of opioids to relieve dyspnea not to end. the intention there is to end not to end the life but to relieve suffering so yeah, i have a doubt yes uh, is it the deliberate intention of uh, undertaken to end the life but yes. suppose a patient who is uh, on ventilator um yes. he is surviving with ventilator because of some problem maybe he is not able to breathe um if you remove the ventilator the person will die yes so in that case you know we tell them if you tell the patient that we remove the ventilator you will die is it it comes under euthanasia or uh... <laughs> that's a very good question so mm. the patient is on ventilator mm. and the patient is in almost persistent vegetative state and he's just living on the support which we are giving otherwise his brain dead and if i remove the ventilator he will die maybe immediately a few days later he may die high chance he may die that is known as withdrawal of life support or sup- suppose a already patient is almost brought brain dead and i don't put him on ventilator knowing that this patient is not going to make through to go uh, 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 come around and i de- decide not to put him on ventilator that is known withholding life support so withdrawing of life support and withholding life support both are not in true sense euthanasia in in law recently passive euthanasia got the legal sanction sorry i'm going little beyond but uh, the indian law says that passive euthanasia is allowed provided you have proper there's a lot of protocol around that but it's legally valid now in india passive euthanasia is nothing but withholding or withdrawing life support what the example you gave right now is actually withdrawing life support that is known as passive euthanasia and that is legal in india but that is not euthanasia you are just withdrawing life support because remember something i mentioned about futile care when a physician decides this intervention is not giving any therapeutic benefit but it's a futile care that's it that is and when you withdraw that f- treatment because it's not going any any benefit you are legally protected because futile care is doesn't it's not a treatment anymore so that's how they look at it next slide so euthanasia is not allowing nature to take its course suppose a very elderly gentleman with advanced disease is not put on ventilator and we just allowing the nature to take its course his progressive disease and he dies that's how it used to be in olden days when uh, somebody is having a life threatening disease we allow the nature to take its course that is not euthanasia stopping biologically futile treatment like the example you mentioned when you think it's it's a futile treatment and you decide to withdraw that futile treatment that is not euthanasia stopping treatment when the burden outweighs the benefit it's causing more harm than doing good that is also not euthanasia and using morphine and drugs to relieve pain or breathlessness is not euthanasia you have to differentiate euthanasia from all this and by the way euthanasia is not legal in india next slide so dilemma in palliative care why are we discussing discussing medical ethics so early in your course is because we are going to face this dilemma again and again in palliative care i'll give you some examples non disclosure of diagnosis to the patient as one of you mentioned we face this every day in our practice relative saying don't tell the patient and what about patient's autonomy so are we justified in not telling the patient because we are strongly advocating for patient's autonomy and here the relatives are telling us not to tell the diagnosis or what we call this collusion 
CPR in terminally patient, ill patient, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, is it justified to give CPR in terminally ill patient? And you know that underlying disease is not curable. So rationale of CPR. Ventilation in a patient with dyspnea advanced cancer. Again, there's enough study to say that it is not useful to ventilate a patient with advanced dyspnea and a cancer. So it's a medically futile treatment. Intravenous fluid, oxygen therapy, antibiotics in terminal stage. These are all often debated, often said to be not useful, but we still many a times, we are, for various reasons, sometimes we land up doing, using all this and there often leads a lot of debate and dilemma in our practice. Next slide. Remember that decisions in palliative care setting are often made in an environment of emotional distress. There's a lot of distress when, we make, uh, when you're talking about end of life care and making decisions. Doctors should be sensitive to the human vulnerability, dependency, and fragility of the patient who is critically ill and to the family member acting as proxy. They're very dependent on us. Every word we say, we, they hang on to it. Every word, every gesture, what we say or do, and, and, what, um, and they're so dependent and they're so vulnerable and they're so fragile. And in a lot of, they're in extreme distress. So we have to be very mindful of that when you ask them to take a decision. Next slide. Many times we don't have a right or a wrong answer. It's not very black and white. Next slide. And when you're not sure, aim for a balanced compromise. Like I said, when you're not sure, balance all the four principles and then try to come to some kind of consensus as to what is the best for the patient. Still, if not sure, next slide. Ask this question to yourself. What if it were me? If you think this is what you would have chosen, maybe you can gently tell the patient, that if I were me, if I were in your position, I would have gone for this kind of approach. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you so much, madam. Uh, I thought uh, we'll take some questions uh, because this is a very uh, actively discussed topic that we have discussed today. So there may be a lot of questions from the participants. Can we take a few questions, Raju? I think. Yes, we can. Just raise your hands or uh, unmute yourself and speak. Yes, we can. And you can type in the chat also if you can't uh, talk. Pure enough, you have a doubt. Is there anyone raising hands? Or yes, I have yeah. one doubt. Yes, Dr. Nimi. Um, how much maximum dose of morphine we can give the patient is Disney? Uh, very good question, Dr. Nimi. I'm sure you're going to have much detailed discussion around this um, topic. But just for um, our, our to make it complete for today for the discussion, morphine dose for dyspnea is decided by, guided by the patient's comfort. I cannot say that this much milligram per kg body weight is the dose, for, uh, dose of morphine for dyspnea. Each patient is different. So I'll start with, unlike pain, we start morphine in very small dose in dyspnea. So we start with, for example, I'll start with 2.5 milligram SOS to begin with. Then maybe I'll make it twice a day or three times a day, which is very different from pain. In pain, we always start with four hourly dosage. Here we start with maybe eight hourly or six hourly dosage. And we say, take as and when required extra dose of morphine. Like that, we build up and gradually build it up. Usually they all need four hourly dosage. But again, the upper limit will be guided by the patient's comfort. Patient may still be appearing like that. They'll be still appearing distinct. But when you ask the patient, they say, oh, I'm much better. So then you know you have to stop here. That's how we decide. 
the clinically we decide what dose is appropriate for the patient. Thank you. And Dr. Mary was about to ask a question. I saw the hands coming up. Yes, Dr. Mary. I want to know <clears throat> the use of ventilator in a I mean in a terminally ill patient. Usually, if you take to a hospital, they keep the patient on the ventilator till the patient dies. If there is use or not, they don't think of. So, what, what does the patient cannot decide upon? And the relatives want them to, on, the, on the ventilator. What shall we do? So, uh, I know this is a very difficult um, situation we face, we face often. And that's the reason that now, let me ask you one question here. They say, when, uh, how do people die? And we're just talking about ventilatory support in advanced disease. So, how do people die? If you look at the pattern of death, I'm sure you had some discussion around that. 10% of our people, they die suddenly, like heart attack, cardiovascular event, or road traffic accident, and they die suddenly. 90% of people, like most of us, how we are going to die today or tomorrow, it's not going to be sudden. It's going to be that we'll suffer from some chronic disease, live for a period of time, and gradually our condition deteriorates, and then we die. Why is that the death is considered as a surprise when we know that we live with this chronic disease for such a long period of time, even a cancer? The basic problem here is that we don't prepare the patient and the family about the possible decline in the patient's condition. And that's discussion because that such kind of discussion does not happen. We don't bring up this discussion about, suppose a patient declines now, we know that ventilator is not going to be helped. So would you like to go for such care or not? I'm telling you, uh, Dr. Nimi, we bring up this discussion. I, we run this hospice. I'm sure you're going to see a lot of patients in Palam India. You'll see that how more and more, when we bring up this discussion quite early on, none of them, they land up being on ventilator. They go to seek ventilator care because they can't see their loved one suffering. That's the reason they say put him on ventilator, he's suffering. But if you take away the suffering without putting him on ventilator, they, I'm sure they don't want to put him on ventilator because ventilator care is not something nobody enjoys. The relatives, they just hate it because they just can't even be with their loved ones during the last days. And the patient simply just, just can't, uh, just, just let go. Any patient who experiences once a ventilator support in their life, they never want to go back again to that ICU because it's not at all a very uh, friendly or a patient um, uh, it's not a nice way to, for people to be uh, in when, when you're in ventilator with all the tubes, all possible tubes going in all the possible orifices, and you're all alone, strange people, strange sound, and then you're suffering so much. So the reason that people seek their ventilator support is because they're suffering. They don't know there's an alternative to it. And if you have palliative care as an alternative, and you discuss with them, give them the choice. We don't give them the choice. If you give them the choice to make, I'm sure majority will say, Majority, you know what they will say, not even palliative care. They say, I, if possible, give me palliative care in my home. I want to be in my home. I want to die in my home. If I ask you this four or not, 22 participants I see, where do you want to die? I'm not going to ask each of you this question, but think yourself. I'm sure majority will say, I want to die in my home, surrounded by the loved ones, my loved ones, if I have, if I have the choice. But that choice is never given. It's never excised. I think there was one uh, question in the chat. I, I hope uh, that question was also answered. It was the other way around where the patient wants the ventilator, but the relatives don't want the ventilator. But I think the basic principle lies in uh, making them understand their comfort can be provided without ventilator. Uh, Dr. Anjali, is your question answered? Any one last question before uh, moving on to case presentation? Because this is a very important topic. Uh, people, you will face these questions once you start working in palliative care. So you must be uh, able to answer it 
you will be facing a lot of dilemmas when you start work. I just want to add that, yeah, I know this in, yeah. it involves a lot of um, skills in communication. Like how do you convey, how do you um, under, give the choice to them and how do you understand their concerns and the wishes based on which they make a decision. It involves a lot of uh, skills in communication, which I'm sure you'll be learning over a period of time. Uh, and that's going to be very helpful for you to have this conversation with the patient and the family, whether to go for ventilator care or not. Dr. Sridevi, how do you propose to teach communication? Uh, Dr. Biju is the one who deals with the communication skills. So it is divided into two sessions. Uh, but by Zoom? Basically, pardon me? Are we going, they do, do they do it by Zoom? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zoom, okay. Zoom. So they don't get a chance to role play as we do in face-to-face -face teaching. But uh, okay. there will be a lot of discussions, case-based discussions. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, doctor, I hope Doctor Mary Martas have a question. Yeah. It's all critical things and uh, last stage, but some patients still want to live and want us to continue their treatment. What do you say then, Madam? Can you just clarify one second, like like an example? What comes like to some your... young young people? They may be like acute myeloid leukemia. But they are uh, able to move about and we, as you said, continuously giving uh, blood transfusion, it is dangerous. But patient insists to do something for me, I want to live long. They say, what do you say about this? So that's a very good question. Madam, one thing is that um, we, first of all, how informed is their decision is something we need to find out. How much they really un un they understood. And I remember I told you about informed choice and informed autonomy. When they take that decision, I hope they are really well informed about the decision, why they're taking that decision. That's number one point. I will check. Number two, I'll check. What is the emotion behind that decision? Why do you want to continue to take that transition? Can you tell me more about it? Why do you, why? Like, reason behind this, this thing about we often presume that they want this because they want to live more, because they want to have, uh, they want to extend their life. Very often the reasons are not that. There may be something more to it. Very often they say that because I want to see my child be born. I want to go back to college. I want to see my graduation ceremony. There must be some reason that they ask for this. So it's very important. This is again part of a communication skill. I will explore. Can you tell you more about when you said you want to go for blood transfusion um, to any extent possible, what ex why exactly you want to, uh, even though I told you it's not going to be beneficial, but you still want to go for it. Is there any particular reason? But I'll explore the reason. But very often these reasons are something which come, we think this is the reason, but often they come up with something very unexpected. And we may have to handle with that situation, but we'll definitely understand the emotion behind that. And I hope the decision is made based on the informed, this is an informed decision. But in spite of knowing everything, and they still want to go ahead with this transition, we'll go by it. We have to agree to do it, because that is their choice. If they know, fully knowing they want to go for it, then it's their choice and we go for it. Because that, that, like I said, that autonomy plays the most predominant role in the whole thing. And I would definitely go for it. But definitely sometimes you may face a situation where I, my moral dilemma, my ethical dilemma may not agree for it. But suppose I don't believe, like I know that in some faith we don't believe in abortion, for example. And we know that we, however much you tell them this is not good for you, not good for baby, not good for, but they still want to go for abortion. And definitely my faith is not agreeing me to uh, allow this to happen. We can always give this choice for the patient and the family and you can transfer the care to some other person who will be willing to do it for you. You, you, don't, you don't have the obligation. When something is not agreeing with you, you can always transfer your care to someone. You can always say, I'm sorry. For me, it's very difficult. But I, I will refer you to someone who may be able to help you better. So we try. It's not a struggling for a responsibility. Sometimes you may have to very painfully take that decision. Thank you, Doctor. I hope we can move on to case presentation now. Yeah, yeah, sure. 
So, good evening all. I am Dr. Amrita from Pallium, India, presenting you with the patient story. So, this patient story was sent to us from another palliative care center and they wanted this to be discussed in our forum. So, I am presenting a patient, 46 years old male, who was diagnosed with carcinoma of appendix with extensive peritoneal metastasis. So, the presenting complaints were abdominal pain, constipation, tiredness and reduced intake. So regarding the history, it started as an abdominal pain that was in May 2018 and on evaluation, the patient was uh, diagnosed to have carcinoma of appendix and underwent appendicectomy. So uh, the histopathological report revealed adenocarcinoma of appendix. He also underwent diagnostic lactotomy in October 2018 that showed extensive peritoneal metastasis and some infiltration to the small bowel and hence the procedure was abandoned. He also underwent 12 cycles of palliative chemotherapy and was admitted for uh, intestinal obstruction and was treated conservatively and was discharged after he received symptom relief. So, uh, when he presented to uh, at the time of admission, his palliative performance score was 40 percentage. He had complaints of abdominal pain that was starting at the right side that spreads to the whole abdomen, which lasted for 30 to 45 minutes, and it comes frequently. And the provoking factor was oral intake. He also had unsatisfactory bubble movements and tiredness. The patient was almost all the time in bed and he sits up with the help of a caregiver. Occasionally, his sleep was disturbed and most of the time he was thinking about the curability of the disease. He knew that it was cancer but was not aware of the incurability of the disease and his treating oncologist has advised to a, them to a pall palliative care center as no curative or palliative oncological interventions were possible. The oncologist has also advised the caregivers not to disclose the prognosis to the patient. So uh, regarding the examination, his vitals were normal. He had a mild abdominal distension with exaggerated bowel sounds. All other systems were within the normal limit. And uh, he had a CT thorax done in 10th July 2014, uh, which showed diffuse omental streakness and omental deposits, dilated small bubble loops with transition point near the distal ilia. Regarding the psychosocial, he lives with his wife and two children, he had a very supportive family and has a strong emotional bonding with his younger sister. Patient want his, wanted his, this sister to be with him all the time and moves with her opinion. Wife doesn't have much voice in decision making. After the diagnosis of malignancy, the patient was staying with the sister and was a, who accompanied him to the hospital during the treatment along with the wife. So financially also he was supported by the sister and the patient was a businessman. So the major concerns are the abdominal pain, curability of the disease and tiredness. So to summarize, here is a 46 year old man with carcinoma of appendix with extensive peritoneal metastasis for which no oncological interventions are possible and has presented with abdominal pain, constipation, reduced oral intake and tiredness and later started to have vomiting. So the points which we would like to have discussion on are what are the ethical issues? in not disclosing the diagnosis or prognosis? Are we ethically bound to disclose the prognosis to the patient? Is it right to tell the caregivers that prognosis should not be revealed to the patient? As the oncologist has already advised them not to disclose the prognosis. So what is the medical diagnosis of abdominal pain, constipation and vomiting? And how should this be managed? Thank you. Thank you, Amrita, for the presentation. Um, 
I think we'll take up the ethics part in the beginning and if time permits, we'll go on to the symptoms uh, because there are a lot of ethical issues uh, came up in this presentation. I would like to uh, ask the participants. I know that we have not covered collusion, but uh, in the ethics, ethical issues point of view, how would you go about it? Raju, please tell me if someone is raising their hands because I can't see everyone together. Uh, no hands are coming up, ma'am. Dr. Okay. Annie? Uh, yes. I said we should, uh, you were telling, you know, it is the patient right to know the diagnosis and uh, not disclosing. I don't know whether it is correct or not. That's what when, after I hear this uh, talk from Dr. Gayatri, um, we should tell and explain more about the disease condition to the patient and make the person to understand. So I don't know whether it is ethical for not disclosing. Anyone else uh, for Dr. Annie's opinion? Or any other suggestions? Since he knows already the diagnosis yeah. of cancer, and then I think we should be able to disclose to him the prognosis too. So what happens to the oncologist? Uh, uh, are we not uh, challenging the, uh, the suggestions told by the oncologist? I think that was what Dr. Amrita was trying to ask. So the treatment for your view of you, he might have told. But then once he is in the palliative care, I think we should uh, be able to uh, disclose to him about the prognosis. I would like to ask Dr. Gayatri about are we ethically bound to disclose the prognosis to the patient? I know that there is a little bit of overlap comes here between the collusion breaking the bad news sessions, but is there, uh, is there anything uh, in the ethics point of view regarding disclosure? Yeah, Sister Vinaya has uh, sent something in the chat. The oncologist was the right person to reveal the prognosis. Um, I suppose Dr. Peorena and Dr. Lucy have something to speak. Yeah. Uh, the diagnosis should be uh, revealed to the patient. Regarding the prognosis, uh, we say like no hope against hope. Like uh, no need of that. We can always give hope against hope for the patient so that you make the patient positively to you know things. Not uh, saying so much uh, when they have cancer and all that, they go to go for chemotherapy or to the hospital itself. Somehow, little bit of they'll come to know something serious is thing going on. But uh, to take the treatment positively, uh, I I think no need of uh, revealing the prognosis to the patient, but to give hope to the patient always. Even for small fever also, uh, we say a lot of uh, positive thinking we ask them to have so that the treatment which you uh, give, it will bring out a lot of miracle to the patient. If it is a negative prognosis, no need of uh, going on, uh, uh, putting pressure on it to the patient. Patient, we can give hope against hope by giving positive thinking. Diagnosis should be revealed to the patient. Yeah, so Sister Pyron is feeling that uh, we should not break the hope so that with hope he can take up uh, treatment more positively, right? Yeah. So what happens in treatment decision making when it comes to the time where he has to choose what he wants towards um, the remaining days of life? Now, there is no right or wrong answer. I'm not questioning Dr. Annie or Dr. Pyrena. Just asking how do you balance because you yourself may feel uncomfortable when the patient is deteriorating and the patient doesn't know and you really want to know what the patient wants uh, when he's approaching um, end of life we really want to take some decisions suppose he whether he needs a tube whether he needs a ventilator whether he needs this that we don't know because patient does 
is not a part of decision making here so uh, how would your moral or ethics work on that sister vinaya has commented we have to break, uh, tell it but in a positive way uh, dr lucy you wish to speak something dr lucy uh, yes uh, doctor uh, we can reveal to the patient about the diagnosis madam and we should tell the uh, relatives and the patient about this and uh, we should tell them to trust in god and all the possible uh, treatment we will be giving just to put trust in the lord we will advise spiritually we can give some advice counseling etc yeah. so dr lucy feels that we should tell the prognosis plus good supportive care anyone else dr purin i think you are left alone no one is supporting you to give uh, hope and to go on so who have logged in as galaxy j2 can you say your name yes doctor please uh, may i know your name ma'am sister jasmine okay doctor you can ask i think with the knowledge of the oncologist uh, you can tell the prognosis to the patient after discussing with the oncologist yeah so the primary treating doctor should be involved so, yeah again she should be knowing about the knowing that we are revealing to the patient because since he has asked not to reveal dr jagriti Uh, yes, uh, with the patient and the relatives, and we should put a question that why oncologist does not want to reveal the prognosis to the patient, because mutually we should agree with the uh, oncologist also, and uh, we should definitely reveal the prognosis. But at the same time, we should tell them that we will make. Uh, as far as possible symptom free will make the comfortable life but according to me i think uh, very tactfully we should discuss the prognosis also thank you so much for your input uh, i think ma'am you can continue there are no hands coming up Yeah, uh, Dr. Gayatri, I would like to uh, put it in this context. What happens within the multidisciplinary team if someone, fe if one member feels that it should not be done? Uh, it can be regarding discussion of prognosis, or it can be regarding any futile treatment. And some of your team members would feel it should not be done, and some may feel it is the right thing to do. So, how will you sort out the ethical dilemmas within the multidisciplinary team? That's a very good question because if you don't have consensus within the team. that can lead to conflict and very conflicting information which a patient and the family may receive because one person may be saying something and other person may be saying totally different i say uh, he is not going to get get all right and the, and the other doctor will say no no everything will be all right that will be very confusing and very con conflicting in terms of the information which we may be uh, conveying to the patient and the family so it's very important to have that consensus within the multidisciplinary team so what i would strongly recommend is to sit down with the team when there is a conflict when there is not all patients will have the situation some patients we may have difference of opinion and that's the time i would say that um have a, a kind of multidisciplinary team meeting and bring this up and find out like one of you mentioned very correctly i totally agree with that person who brought this up saying that why what why what exactly your concern as regard to discussing the prognosis with the patient and you know that it's advanced disease it's it develop multiple bowel obstruction it's going to have more symptoms so how long are we going to say everything will be all right so what what exactly is your concern when you're saying you don't want to discuss the diagnosis so that's the kind of approach which i will take and finding out why they think to discuss with the patient and the family so that's the one thing which i will do uh as regard to many of you agreed that this that there should be 
diagnosis should be discussed with the patient. All of you very vehemently agreed. I'm very surprised. Many, many doctors they say, oh, don't tell the patient directly. You know, patient may lose hope and many things they say, emotional reaction. Their biggest concern is the emotional reaction to telling the diagnosis. Uh, yes, we all agree. Patient's autonomy is a big thing. But in the West, there's no discussion around that. It is always patient's autonomy. There's no relative who will be there uh, around for that kind of thing. Uh, they come secondary. But in our context, one thing we have to un understand is that our in our culture, patient and the family, they function as a unit. <coughs> separately. So in that situation, if you go against the family and decide to tell the patient, that may lead to conflict. And the family may get upset. They may decide to take the patient away from you and the patient may be deprived of the treatment which is required for him. So we have to handle this very carefully. Even though it's very, you are very clear in your mind that patient should know the diagnosis, we may have to work with the relatives. I'm not going into detail of how because we're going to have a discussion around that subject. But we have to realize that we can we have to with the family before we discuss with the patient. And because the family is very important core for, uh, element of our whole uh, that when you talk about the team teamwork, we have to work with them together. And uh, legally. When you are in, when you decide to enter a contract with the patient, the patient is your primary responsibility. You are answerable to the patient. In fact, it's the other way around. When uh, you are entering into contract with the patient, it's, it's with only patient permission that you should be discussing the diagnosis with other family members or other people. You cannot legally actually disclose patient's diagnosis to other people just like that. That's how it is legally, but we don't realize that. But we more look at the cultural context and the we work around that. Yeah, that's all I have to say. And talking about hope, I saw one this one point about raising, uh, giving positive hope. Yes, we all live on hope. We all need hope to live. Otherwise, we'll, we we may, may stop living because we don't have hope. But remember that in in this context, when you talk about advanced progressive disease, we must remember to give a realistic hope. We should not be giving them false hope. Because false hope will not hold, um, it, we cannot hold on to that for long. Because this patient, imagine this patient now, uh, abdominal disseminated malignancy. Today I may say, oh yeah, everything is alright, you'll be fine. Tomorrow, he, the disease may progress. He may develop spinal metastasis or metastasis to lung. And then you say, no, no, it has gone to lung. Or, or your, and patient may develop paraplegia if it has gone to spine. How can you say that everything is all right? So you should refrain from giving false hope. You must give hope what you can give. If I see at this patient, the hope I will be giving to this patient is that that means I see that you are suffering so much. I don't know about the disease, whether I'll be how much I'll be able to control or correct the disease. But surely, one thing we can I can help you with this. I can take I'll help you with your pain and your symptoms so that you don't suffer. That's a hope I can give because I know that I can do that. So this is how we work. We work with such patients, giving hope. We, even though we are, we take away one hope of not being able to cure. We always instill a hope that we'll take care of your suffering. So there, you're giving a realistic hope. Yeah, dealing with the hope, uh, bringing down the unrealistic hope to a realistic one is made important thing when you talk about these kind of ethical issues and it's really important to involve the oncologist the treating doctor because most often patients would want to hear from them because you are seeing them at a late stage of disease and they really trust the treating doctor that doctor told me that this will be fine but how can you contradict with that so uh, it's always uh, good if at all possible to talk to the treating doctor and come to a consensus. And we don't know whether exactly the doctor has said like that. It's yeah, that, that, That's what you hear from the relatives. Uh, so we need to clarify what exactly the doctor told. And it's really good to have a communication with the treating doctor before we uh, jump on to uh, disclosing the prognosis to the patient. Any other questions before we conclude? I can't see anyone's hand coming up. I suppose there isn't anyone. Yeah. 
so with that maybe we can conclude today's session uh, uh, these are always uh, i think after ethics sessions we always have a lot of lingering thoughts in our mind a uh, lot of patients will come to our mind whether we, sh we could have done that or a lot of uh, doubts especially regarding withdrawal and withholding life support and discussions i know that there are still more questions in your mind regarding withdrawal withholding life support because it's a very uh, very uh, unclear sometimes very unclear area when you start dealing with such patients we can take up any questions through emails also you can write to uh, uh, raju she will convey to the faculty if you have any queries in your mind we could we could not discuss it today and uh, thank you so much dr gayatri i know that you are so busy and you could take uh, one and a half hours from your schedule it's a it's a really uh, good thing for us uh, and it's nice to hear from you uh, 